Hello and welcome back to another episode in CSC 263, Database Management Systems at Adelphi University. We're still talking about introductory topics. Uh, we, in the previous two videos, discussed uh, some basic terminology about databases, and in the previous video we looked at where the database fits in its environment. Today we'll figure out uh, what database management systems mean for web-based applications. This is chapter three in the book, as well as some additional material that you probably will not find in the book. So over the last um, 10 years plus, um, databases and data, and I should say enterprise applications have changed a lot when it comes to their architecture. Um, if 10 years ago we were asked to design an information system, the assumption was almost immediately that we would be building some kind of a graphical user interface that would run on the user's desktop, which was connected to a hardwired network connection. The application would then connect back to a database backend um, where the data was stored. Over the last 10 years, that has changed dramatically. Um, we now almost from the beginning assume that the user is not going to install any software on their own computer because they already have a browser and they expect to access their information systems with that web browser and preferably with nothing else. That uh, requires a change in mindset, um, but it does not necessarily mean that the role of the database has changed. How it fits in the overall architecture, though, that is a little bit different. So when we look at that original mechanism where we would have to install some client on our desktop that would connect back to some server, um, aptly that is called client server. Um, and where we would have many clients throughout the enterprise um, that would be able to connect back to a handful of servers. Each server would have uh, the ability to hold a uh, host multiple connections at the same time so that multiple users at the same time can access the same data. Um, the implicit assumption was almost always that you had to be physically present on the enterprise network, whether that was through a direct connection or through a VPN service. Um, that um, was something that could be changing from environment to environment. But the fact that the service was accessible via an, a web browser and also in a way that was always on, no matter where you are, that is really something that we have not seen until, like I said, the last 10 years or so. Just like um, we see a fairly rapid evolution happening now for mobile applications, where the assumption is almost that we develop mobile first and web second. Um, the benefit of client server, was that it was fairly easy to distribute distribute logic between what would you process on the front end and what would you process on the back end. The server was the back end, the front end was the client. And typically when it meant uh, crunching large amounts of data, that would happen on the back end, but anything that was computationally intensive, especially when it came down to user interfacing, that would happen on the front end. And that allowed for a fairly even distribution of workload. Now, data grew and data kept on growing. And the amount of data that we have now is mind blowing. Um, you know, compared to 10 years ago, we wouldn't even even estimate it, uh, how much data we typically store and, and manipulate on a single application. And as a result, client server kind of started to hurt. It didn't really fit as well anymore. Um, and as a result, we had to come up with a different architecture. That became a three-tiered architecture. Still, the um, web browser wasn't necessarily there, but we started separating out data processing and data retrieval, data storage, but also some of the common data processing that happened on the client. And both of those went to the middle, to an application server that hosted the business logic where the client could focus primarily on user interfacing, the back end, the database, could focus primarily on data validation and database access, and then the middleware, uh, the application server, would do the rest. This was a stage, um, but it was not by itself the most ideal way to develop web-based applications or even mobile apps, uh, 
For that, we came up with an n-tiered application where we no longer limit how many of these intermediate tiers we have. You know, when we develop a web application, right now we often see the first tier being um, the web browser. The second tier um, is the web server that handles, in many cases, um, you know, all kinds of HTTP-related issues, uh, encryption on TLS, all of that stuff. The, the web server might pass some of the web traffic over to an application server, and the application server might throw it down to a database server. And so we start seeing many more of these intermediate layers. And that is good from one perspective, because now each layer can focus on its own um, area of specialization. But on the other hand, you know, the whole architecture becomes more complex and it becomes highly dependent on having established network connectivity. Just like the applications often became so large that they had to be split out over different components, the databases themselves also grew, and they grew uh, almost to a point that they did not fit on a single computer anymore. And so that means that we now have to start coming up with a way to store some data on one computer and some data on the other, but still make that completely transparent to the database application because they don't want to know where their data comes from. Before we can dig into that, we have to look at scaling and growth. Um, roughly, if you can say, we have a thing called vertical growth and horizontal growth. When we talk about vertical growth, we talk about growth within a single computer system. If my computer is out of memory, I put more memory in. If it's out of storage, I put more disks in. If the processing happens too slow, oh, that becomes tricky because most of the software we write, we write is not meant to do uh, use multiple processors very effectively. So that's already an issue. Um, and so there are limits on how many, how much hardware I can add to a single box for it to still work. Those are the limits of vertical growth. The benefit for us as application developers, though, is that vertical growth does not require any special accommodations for our programming. On the other hand, we have horizontal growth, where we acknowledge the fact that our single computer might not be able to handle the workload anymore, and that means that we need to start distributing that workload over multiple computers. Some happens over here, other happen over there. But that requires additional logic, additional complexity, and it does require us to write our programs differently. When we do that for databases, we move to what's called a distributed database, a database which has data stored on multiple nodes, as we call them in many cases. And so whether that is the same data spread over multiple locations just for optimization, and we call that often clustering, um, or if we take little bits of data and put that on different systems, we call that sharding, or a combination of those two, um, clustering and sharding, that makes for a very complex field of study. Not something that we are going to worry about in this undergraduate databases class, but it is something that we look at in our graduate class. The other benefits of um, cluster, for, of, I should say distribution, is often um, uptime guarantee. Because if I have the same data on multiple computers and one of those computers fails, well, I still have the other one. And maybe you know, on two computers, it's a 50% hit. But if I have 10 computers, missing one only takes a 10% hit. And you know, that's often recoverable. Um, the same thing if I start sharding my data out. So for example, the EU um, just um, basically ruled that the US safe haven or safe harbor for data is not sufficient enough. And that means that EU data cannot be shipped off to the United States without further assurances. So now companies will have to choose, now, do I keep data about European um, residents in the EU and data residents in the Uni about US residents in the US? Now I'm going to segment my database into different pools based on geographic location in this case. And there are benefits, again, there are also um, disadvantages. Complexity is the main disadvantage. We might also say, listen, um, as we grow um, and we start putting more computers in my data center, why am I still doing this in my own data center? You know, I, can I not do it in someone else's data center? Can I not 
have this stuff run on someone else's computer and while they're running that stuff on their computer can they just take care of those computers for me as well you know that's the whole concept that came with cloud computing which is also impacting the way that we design databases a typical cloud-based infrastructure is not optimized for high io input output transactions and so there are different types of databases that you will find through cloud service providers some of the cloud services though have benefits and disadvantages um, but in order to consider something to be a cloud service it has to be on demand and so in other words i should be able to just basically swipe my card and you know, blink my eyes and my new infrastructure should be there or bigger or smaller or whatever it may be it should be self-service i should be able to do this without having to have extensive hands-on operations on the service provider side we should be able to pay as we go and that is a major um, game changer uh, before if i needed 10 computers i needed to buy 10 computers now i can rent 10 computers for an hour and then give them back again so we only pay for what we need you know this is not my slogan um, we want to be able to scale easily, so very quickly, bring in more resources. But when we're done with that, um, having additional resources, I also want to be able to scale down again to keep my costs low. And we want to be able to access this infrastructure from anywhere at any time. And of course, that um, adds a lot of complexity as well. But that is the environment in which we're working today. If we're talking about cloud services, we have three main types. We have software as a service, we have platform as a service, and we have infrastructure as a service. If I'm developing an information system and I'm developing it as being a cloud service that users can just use, directly interact with, then I'm creating software as a service. People don't need to install anything, they just access my interface over the web, and I will take care on my backend that all of my clients' data, for example, is separated and backed up. That's the easiest one to get started with and also the lowest barrier to entry. In platform as a service, I am going to still take ownership of my own applications. I am going to be the application developer, the application manager, but a service provider is going to give me the environment in which I can run the application. That means that I don't have to worry about hardware. That means I don't have to worry about operating systems and any of that stuff. I can just load my program into the cloud and it will run. So less work for uh, the cloud service provider, more work for me, but it also gives me more control. One step further than that is infrastructure as a service where the cloud service provider basically gives you a virtual operating system. You have your um, OS, whatever you install within that OS is up to you, um, but you have to maintain the operating system. The only thing that you don't have to maintain is the hardware. And as we start seeing many of these development trends happening, we see that a lot of different service models are being adopted. In many cases, our traditional databases don't work as well with them as we would like to, and therefore new types of databases are being developed. Um, but it's good to know how this all fits in the bigger picture. Then lastly, the thing we need to mention is there is a database and there's a data warehouse. A database gives you a snapshot of data in time. You know, if I make a change to an, a record in a database, that record has changed. I can't look back and say what was the previous version of this value, unless I store that too somewhere, um, which means that a database is this constantly changing set of data. It's constantly updating and changing and, and, and you know evolving over time. And sometimes that's not what I want. You know, sometimes I want to be able to run a report and say, for example, what is my enrollment today compared to what it was a year ago and two years ago? And unless I stored that somewhere in my database, I cannot ask a typical database management system what the value a year ago was. Enter where data warehouses come in. Data warehouses are um, developed around this concept, where they take a snapshot of data. Um, and then freeze that data with a timestamp on it. That means that I can do much more easily uh, reporting, but I take the price that it is not 100% up-to-date data. It could be a day old, it could be a week old, it could be a year old. Um, the data in a database is typically organized also around uh, the process that the application supports. In a data warehouse, you can change that. 
you can say, okay, rather than you know, having some information about a student in the registration system, some in the library system, some maybe with housing, I'm going to put all student data together in my data warehouse where the individual processes can still maintain their own data, but when they're done with it and they start handing it off to the warehouse, I put it all together into a single location. Um, it also means that the warehouse can pull in data from a large number of different sources. So the data warehouse is a related concept to databases, and most likely the warehouse is built on a database, but it is a different type of application. It is an application that looks at freezing the data at a point in time so that it does not change and that supports reporting rather than data maintenance. And the database focuses primarily on data, ma data maintenance, querying and retrieving. That was uh, chapter three uh, with some additional materials about the cloud. Um, that's it for this video. Uh, next time around, uh, we'll move on to the next topic.